Hello, I trust you're doing well. Welcome to my channel. My name is Sharon and I am here to share in the word of God. I am very grateful for the opportunity to share in the gospel of Jesus Christ, of redirecting back, people back to him and fulfilling the mandate that he has put on me in this season of sharing a message of repentance of sharing a message of returning to Jesus because time is very short. We are indeed in the end time. If you've watched any of my other videos, that is the consistent theme that Jesus Christ is asking us to return to him um, because he wants us to have a deeper relationship with him, not only just so he can fellowship with us, but so that he can strengthen us during this end time so that we keep our place in him. And so today I will be talking about uh, a message that um, it's not um, necessarily a prophetic word, but it's just something that the Spirit of God has been ministering to me about. Um, today, I woke up in the morning and I was really thinking about um, the seven churches that the Holy Spirit was giving the message or that the Lord was giving John a message um, to deliver. Um, and I don't even think that's correct English, but anyway, yeah. I think the message got there. You understand what I was trying to say. Um, so these churches were given very specific messages. And today I just thought that um, I just share some things that I learned when as I was doing my Bible study. Because I think it is important that every man realize that we are all being classified. Especially, I'm talking to Christians. This message is specifically for Christians um, who you believe in Jesus Christ. You have already proclaimed that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, whether you did it now or you did it before, whether you're backslidden, um, you at some point have um, embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have proclaimed that he is Lord of you over your life. Um, so, and I believe, I, I honestly believe that every Christian falls somewhere within these seven churches. These seven churches represent, every, it represent um, the church as a whole. So it doesn't mean that because you're not in Ephesus that you cannot possibly be part of the Ephesian church. Or if you're not in Smyrna, you, you can't possibly be part of the, the Smyrna church or Pergamum or Theatira, etc. So, I and that's why I, la I label this um, topic, this video, I'm going to label it Examine Yourself, O Church. Why? Because all of us, we are falling somewhere. Among these seven churches, we are falling somewhere. And so it's up to you to um, study this and examine yourself. Examine yourself with um, an honest microscope. Examine yourself with an honest microscope and see where you fall. Because then there you'll be able, if you're honest with yourself, then there you will be able to identify an area of deficit and you will be able to change yourself and make yourself whole. And um, as part of this, I will be sharing a little bit about my testimony, um, only in part, not in full, because um, this is a very long message and I do not want to be on camera for two hours um, just talking about the same issue. So that is what we are going to be into doing today. So again, the topic of this message is examine yourself, O church. Um, and um, we're going to be reading from the book of Revelation. There is going to be a lot of Bible reading while we're doing this. So we're going to um, be reading from the book of Revelation. And um, I use the NRSV. I think um, maybe this is not a good idea because it's probably backwards for you guys. But the version that I use is the new revised standard version, which I personally love. I would definitely recommend this version because it has simple English. But at the same time, I feel for me when I compare it to other um, versions, I find that it gives me a more, um, without making the language so difficult, it gives me a more um, accurate, I, I feel like the language is more the time that this, that the Bible was written. Um, even the terminologies, they're, they're more accurate than other versions. Um, and, you know, and that, that's just my opinion. Uh, but if, if you have something else that works for you, I mean, definitely stick to what works for you but um also another thing i love about this bible is that it has they have the option of having the 12 apocryphal books so you can buy just the basic canon 
texts that are with every Bible, which is the 66 books. Or you can also have, in addition to the 66 books, 12 apocryphal books, which um, for some reason, some people decided that it was a good idea to take them out. But I found this to be very helpful. In fact, I found that a lot of the apocryphal books, they help fill in the gaps of maybe you might have had a question of how did this happen? How did that happen? A lot of gaps are filled there. So um, yeah, definitely recommend it. But um, first, know your Bible, know your 66 books, and then you can go and extend yourself to read other books. Otherwise, um, it's like you're eating. I don't know. I, I, I just feel like it doesn't make sense for you to go and try and get other, Bible, other, other texts if you're not even well versed with what you already have, what, what is already in front of you, if you're not even um, trying to read that, and then you're running to read other texts, regardless of whether they were removed or not. So yeah, we have a huge responsibility, as I've always said, to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. It's nobody else's responsibility. Every Christian has their own responsibility to do that for themselves. And so you, you should not be looking at your pastor to read the Bible for you and uh, interpret text. It's you who should be reading the Bible and praying before Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will guide you in understanding the word of God. Okay, so we will start reading the book of Revelation chapter 2. Um, and the first message was to the church of Ephesus. So um, in chapter 1, you will, um, the Lord is telling um, John in verse 11, he's saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches of Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, to Sadis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And so, um, and this is right after he's starting to see this vision. Um, and that tells you how important it is for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ um, to have the church in order because we are a representative of him. So he wants us to be on the street and now he wants to clean us up. He wants to renovate us. Hence the reason why it is necessary for him to clean us up, to break our foundations. If you haven't listened to that message already about the breaking of foundations, it is necessary for him to break our foundations and to make us what he wants to be, to renovate us and make us what he wants to be because we are the true representatives of who he is. We're the ones who have his mantle. He left us here to spread the gospel, not only by preaching, but also by how we live our lives. Yeah? Okay. So um, in Revelations chapter 2, um, so here, here is the message to the churches. So he starts with um, the message to Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from when you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. So the Lord is speaking to the church of Ephesus, which has, in his translation, they have done, they are very, they are very particular about discernment. They're very, very particular about testing. They're very particular about identifying people who are false. And they're also very particular about, um, you know, staying on the straight and narrow. They don't want any compromise. And that, th that's what he's talking about. When he's talking about you have hated the works of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were popular. Um, I think it's in, the, in a few verses down in verse... Fifteen. Verse from verse, let me start from verse 14. From verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against you. He's talking to the church in Pergamum, of which we will discuss later. But he's saying that um, these people who have the teaching of Balaam, who have taught the Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and engage in sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And so what the Nicolaitans teachings, it, it was pretty much compromise. 
you're not on the straight and narrow you're you're you're, you're kind of um towing the line you're, you're not really um you're eating from idols you're committing adultery but at the same time you want to call yourself a, ch a child of god and so the church in ephesus the the, the members of the, the ephesus congregants were not willing to accept that they were not willing to accept that so they had very strong faith they had very strong um objectivity as far as deciding what is right and what is wrong and you see even um like they are they, they are like okay they are particular about tolerating evildoers they test those who claim to be apostles but so they catch they catch the the deceptive apostles they catch them really quick because to them it's like it, if it doesn't look like god it's not god if it doesn't look and, the, and there's christians who are like that if it doesn't look like god it is not god if it doesn't um act like god it is not god and so they are unwilling they're unwilling to accept anything that doesn't they, they are very familiar with what is true let me say it like that i think i had a, somebody told me one time i don't know how true this is that when bankers are being trained to know money that they are given how they train them to know real money uh, uh, apart from the counterfeit except for now that they have that pen but they never used to have that pen so what they would do is they would make them touch make them so familiar with what is true that when they got what was false it was easily identifiable so the people in ephesus were so familiar with what is true that when that is false came they would touch it immediately and they would say this is not right this is not mine I am not going to accept it but here is the problem they had fallen behind in works so i guess it's true what uh what peter was saying when he said that you you tell me he said faith without works is not it has no good you say you have faith and i can tell you that there's if you don't have if you don't have works to go along with your faith then it is the two are symbiotic they have to be there you can't have faith and have not have works and you can't have works and not have faith you need both and later on you'll see another church that had works and no faith and for that reason they fell into legalism right so this church in ephesus had failed in works and so the lord has started to say listen you have abandoned the love you had for me at first there was a love because works works are it's like a, it's like a worship the worship that you give God, oh, um, you know, feeding the sick, feeding the um, the ill, uh, the, the 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 people, the the orphans and the widows, feeding these people who need help, like actually going and doing things. You understand? You're not just sitting on your back. You you're actually moving and doing things that rep show that you are a representative of Christ. They were falling behind on this on these things, and so he said, "But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then." From where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first if not i will come to you and remove your lampstand from in place from its place unless you repent so the warning for them because you have stopped to do the works at first and this show you shows you how important it is not only to have faith in jesus christ not only to know that jesus is lord not only to call him the lord of your life not only to proclaim him not only to um embrace him um, embrace him and say this is true. The, Jesus, he died on the cross. I am saved because of him. Not, not only do you don't just stop there, but you need to move on and do that which he has commanded you to do. You need to go on and do the works that he has commanded you to do. Failure to do so, he will take away your lampstand. He will take you because you're not, you're unfruitful. You are unfruitful. So he will take you away. Why? Because why, why should he keep you around if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing anyway? Because God hates unfruitfulness. He really does. He really detests unfruitfulness. And, and we can see that when he, um, I believe there's a story, uh, and you can, you can Google exactly where it is. I know it's in the Gospels, where he, he cursed a fig tree for not having fruit when he was ready to eat it. He cursed a fig tree. And, and I think I spoke about that um, in one of my videos where I was talking about churches that do not bear fruit, that the Lord was going to take them away for the purposes, for the simple reason that they failed to bear fruit. Yeah. So with that says, with that said, this is, um, so this was the, the complaint that the Lord had against them. And there was a demand that you need to repent. And if you don't repent, I am going to take you out of place. 
I'm going to disregard you. I'm going to take away your lampstand and it will be as if you've never existed. Personally, I believe I was part of this church because I didn't have a problem understanding who God was. I didn't have a problem understanding what was evil and what was not. I had no tolerance for pastors who are mixture. I had no tolerance for fellow, like I, I, I got agitated. I think I gave my story. I got very agitated when I saw mixture in the church. I got very agitated when I saw mixture in the music industry. For those who do not know, I used to do music. I, um, I used to go under the title of um, Penzi Amani, which means peace and love. And um, I, I really hated what I saw in the music industry. And that was one of the reasons why I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't, I don't want to do this. I do not want to be a part. But then in me taking away my works, it was no wonder that all of 2023, the Lord would come to me and say, look how far you have fallen. Come back to your first love. Look how far you have fallen. Come back to your first love. And I have to admit, and this is uh, part, the test, part of the testimony that I want to give. When, um, when turmoil came into my home, it was really, really bad. It was really rocky in my home. When turmoil came into my home, and I believe it was judgment, for me and for my spouse it was judgment for us because we had completely abandoned the things of god um when the spirit of god was was dealing with me because at that point i was forced to turn to him and i was forced to start seeking him because i knew that there was no way i was going to make it out of this alive except i go with him and i think i even told my friend i told my friend i'm not going to go through this alone i'm going to go through this with jesus christ and so the vision that um the the vision I'm, i don't know if I, I can call it a vision but the thing that was on my mind it was like a why something like this and on this side on this side which would be my right on my right i had a path in which there was two stories of two different women let me start there with the why each story this side so this is me coming from the bottom right from the bottom where my my stem is right here right okay i'm coming here from the bottom and so i have two options i cannot keep going like this so i have to choose my direction i had to choose my right or my left on my right hand side on my right hand side there was a story of our the woman that the story that would come to me when i would think and, and i believe it was the spirit of god telling me he was telling me now this is your time to choose and to be honest, I told my, my one of my aunts, um, she's a missionary. I told her this, she was shocked. I told her, auntie, I really felt this was my last call. That I didn't have a lot of options. That I, he was not going to keep coming. That this was my last call. So on my right side, I had the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And then on my left, I had the story of... Um, Abigail, the wife of Nabal and David. And what was clear to me is there was one option that was not given to me anymore. I was not going to continue the way I was, where I was no I was neither I was I was proclaiming God as the Lord of my life, but not really doing anything for him. Not really worshiping, not really praying not really doing anything, but clearly saying that he is God and there is no other God but him. So I was not allowed to continue on that path anymore. The Lord was not going to allow that. It was not an option for me anymore. I had to choose who I was going to serve. I was going to choose whether I was going to be like Sapphira and follow my foolish husband, Ananias, and, and um, with that, die with him, or... If I was going to become Abigail and rise up from my place, get on my donkey and run to the root of Jesse, who is Jesus Christ, and then ask him to forgive me and my household and maybe give my family a chance. This right side had a lot of assurance, like there was, it was very clear what my end game was going to be, but the left side I felt there was uncertainty, but there was hope on the left side. And so for me, I chose, and this was my left. And really, when you think about it, I know we say that the ship go on the left and the, 
uh, um, the, the sheep go on the right and the um, the goats go on the left. When you think about it, when the Lord is looking at me and he's presenting this thing like this, then my right is his left and my, you get what I'm saying? You get what, what is going there? So he was, he, was, he was pretty clear on what he wanted with me. It was a matter of my choice. And he was pretty clear that it was not going to continue, that he was not going to have it anymore to where I continue in the same path. Of, and this was my last chance. I, I didn't have an option to not make a choice. I had to make a choice and I had to make it now. Choose today whom you will serve. I believe this is what happens to people who are in the church of Ephesus. And maybe this is you who has um, had this um, situation with you where the Lord is telling you, hey, you need to make a choice right now. Yes, you know me. Yes, you don't tolerate evildoers. Yes, you have tested those who claim to be apostles and you catch them, but your works are missing. Come back to the first love. The way you used to love me, I need you to love me like that again. I need you to abandon all things the way you abandoned them before and return to me. So there's people who are in the church of Ephesus that have this particular call where they are told, hey, make up your mind. Because if you don't, this is your last call. And you're not going to be allowed to continue the way you've been. It's not an option anymore. It's you either leave the gate, get out of the congregation, get out and go and go serve the enemy, in which point you will surely die. or you can turn the other way, return to me, and there might be, there just might be an opportunity for safety. If you read the story of Nabal and um, Abigail, I believe it is in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25. I won't go through it. Please go read it for yourself. 1 Samuel chapter 25. You will see how this woman rose up and because of her, the males in her household were saved. They were all saved. David was, was going to come and slash all the males in her household. But she was saved. And all the males in her home were saved because of her. Nobody was harmed by the, by the army of David. Okay? Yeah, so that is one, one church. So let's go on to the next church, um, a message to Smyrna. Now, this is a very different church. Um, chapter, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty. Even though you are rich, I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have affliction. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. And this is one of this is a church that God has no complaint. There's some some Christians. God has no complaint. He has no complaint with you. He knows that you know. And, and these are probably some people who look very. They look like they're nothing, but they are a lot. And you, you see, he even says, I, "I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich." So you, you look poor, you look afflicted, but to me, I see your wealth. I see the wealth, your core, how you are, your spiritual, your spiritual giants. You look little, you look so small. You look so small, but yet you are so powerful. There's people like this, they don't have to do a thing. They don't have to do a thing because God already has them in his mind. And the only thing he requires of them, he only gives them warning. He makes them like a friend does. Just like he did with Abraham when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, where he went and said, you know, am I going to do this without telling my friends? So he came and told them, he told them, listen, so do not fear what you're about to suffer because your enemies are coming and you are going to suffer. And, and I believe these are the tribulations he's talking to them. Beware of the devil who is about to throw some of you in prison so that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have affliction, but be faithful until death. So he encourages them. He tells them, you know, and this is the message that I had um, that I just recently posted uh, about um, enduring till the end. And this is the only requirement he has of them. It's just endure till the end. I have no complaint against you. All you have to do is endure. Endure. Stay steadfast. Do not turn. Do not move to the left. Do not move to the right. Do not move any way away from me. 
stay steadfast, endure till the end, and the second death will not have a hold of you. And maybe this is you. And if that's the case, examine yourself and examine yourself um, honestly. Don't place yourself with this subgroup when really you are Laodicea who are lukewarm. This group, um, they know themselves. And the Lord does not request anything else of them other than they keep steady. They keep steady. They keep moving. They keep moving. And even though the tribulations come, they keep steady. They keep moving. And the second death will not have a hold of them. Amen. I pray that all of us end up here. I pray because I believe that even with these churches, that we transition. That as you fix yourself, you transition. I pray that we will be in Smyrna. A church that the Lord has no complaints about. But just says, stay steady, keep moving. Then you have the church in Pagamum. And to the angel of the church in Pagamum write, these are the words of him who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name and you do not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold of the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and engage in sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So it is um, Nicolaitans. They were similar to the teaching of Balaam. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. And remember here, the Lord already introduces himself. Um, I found it very interesting that with every church, he talks, he introduces himself differently as to whom he wanted to be for that church in that moment. Um, and for this particular church, he says, these are the words of him who has a sharp two-edged sword. A sharp two-edged sword. So repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember, when we talk about the armor of God, don't we call the sword, the, the word of God, sword? So, and what does a sword do? A sword slashes. A sword cuts deep. A sword opens you. It's, it's like a judgment. It's a, it's a judgment. A double-edged sword. It, it cuts deep and doesn't leave. Like it's not... Um, it, 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 it cuts everything open. Like it doesn't leave anything... It's not like a like a like a kitchen knife. Like as it goes in and comes out, it will cut, right? So let anyone who hears listen to the spirit of, to the to what the spirit is saying to the churches, to everyone who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give white stone. On the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. So this church has already witnessed persecution. However, there's still some immorality and there's still um, people who are eating of the food of idols. There's compromise. There's compromise within this church. And so he's calling out the people who are compromised. Not everyone is compromised. Only some are compromised. He is calling the ones who are compromised and he is saying that they need to repent of their sexual immorality. They need to repent of the sacrifice of to idols they need to repent of that because if they don't repent then he will come against them he will judge them with the sword of his mouth and if they and and but then he says that if they conquer to everyone who conquers to ever everyone who conquers conquers this abnormal trait this um this compromise that is in the church he says that he will give them manna I, I went to the book of Exodus. I think it's Exodus 16. Because I wanted to understand what this manna means. Like, I, I know about manna. I know that they used to get food. But I wanted to understand the detail between how he was giving them manna. So 
So in Exodus 16, where he was giving them the bread from heaven, this food was supposed to be daily sustenance. So in verse 4, chapter 16, verse 4, Exodus 16, chapter verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. Whether on that day, in that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gathered on other days. So this food, um, but it had, the, the manna was, um, they were hungry in the desert and the manna was supposed to feed them as, as well as quail. They used to get quail for meat that they would eat to feed them because they were very hungry in the wilderness. There was no food. And part of the instruction is that when you got manna for the day, you had to take only one omer a day for each person that was in the household. For example, if you had seven people in the household, you only took one omer. Like, um, I think it was a, a, a way that they measured. I don't know uh, exactly what an omer looks like. But you had only had to take one omer a day. And then um, on the sixth day, you, you would take double the portions because on the Sabbath, there was no manna that was going to come from heaven because it was supposed to be a rest day. So, and the purpose of this food the purpose of this food was for it to be sustenance. It was going to sustain them. So what he's saying is that if you conquer, because they are holding fast to his name and they do not deny faith, even when they're experiencing persecution. So these people are already experiencing persecutions. And what I couldn't help think about the countries where even in this day, they're still being persecuted. Like the tribulations haven't started the world spread tribulation but they they still experience they experience persecution they're hiding they have underground churches they don't worship they don't have the privilege like here in the u.s or in a place like my home country kenya they don't have the privilege of being able to worship freely they hide they go into underground churches they are bibles they are they are torn apart in papers and they share their bible like that because they, they really do not have the privilege of being able to go purchase a Bible from a Bible store. You know what I'm saying? And unfortunately, this will soon be the state in the whole world. But these people are enduring so much persecution, but they are holding fast to the name of Jesus Christ. But among them, there are people, because usually in these places that they have all these things happening, also there is a lot of idol worship around them. There's a lot of idol worship in that in, in around them because usually these countries also honor other gods. And that's the reason why they do not want Christianity because they have completely decided that this Jesus is not the true king of kings or the true lord of lords. Okay? So they they believe in the midst of a lot of time when. But the Lord is saying, Don't worry, for you who conquer, for you, you who conquer this adversity. For you who conquer um, the 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 um, temptation to worship idols and to be sexually immoral, and uh, another thing I've learned in studying the Word of God, I think it was in the book of Ezekiel where I saw something interesting. I and it helped me understand the different meanings of sexual immorality. Because human beings, we have a tendency to think that sexual immorality is only when you sleep with another human being that is not your spouse. And um, and for this matter, because of the times that we are in, I would say that is not your spouse of the opposite sex. Um, same sex is not legitimate marriage according to the Bible. However, so you, 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 you're committing adultery by sleeping with um, someone of the, outside your, the bounds of what is supposed to be correct. The, the marriage covenant which is demonstrated in the bible of a man and a woman coming together that is what we think of when we say sexual immorality or if you go into strange types of sex where you you're sleeping with um, children or when you're sleeping with um, animals strange types of sex uh, or, or, or homosexuality or sodomy that is what we think of when we think of sexual immorality but i have come to learn that another form of sexual immorality that the god that, that God um, calls out, I wanted to say the God of God, because I read that somewhere, anyway, that God calls out 
um, is the immorality of giving yourself to other gods. And other gods can be actual deities, they can be sculpture idols, or they can be things that you adore more than you adore God. To God, that is whoredom. It is you giving yourself to another being, because remember, you're betrothed to him. And while you're betrothed to him, you're supposed to remain sanctified. You're supposed to remain in the sanctity of relationship with Jesus Christ. However, when you give yourself to other things, other beings, other items, because some of these gods, they're just items. When you give yourself to these gods, then you are committing adultery in his eyes. It is sexual immorality to him. So these people, I don't know why, when I was reading this, that was who is in mind, the, the countries in Asia where people are hiding, but yet they are surrounded by so much idolatry. It is easy for them to find themselves being cast away and interacting with these idols in ways that are not holy. And so he says, um, to everyone who conquers, I will give some hidden manna. And what he say is, I will give you sustenance. I will hold you up. I will keep you. I will sustain you. I will give you my word. I will not allow you to stay hungry. Just like he did with the children of Israel. He gave them and he gave them just enough. Just enough to keep on going. Just enough to keep on walking. Just enough to keep on marching. Never did they go hungry. As long as they followed his instruction, they did not go hungry. And mark this, they were not allowed to keep what was yesterday for tomorrow. And they were not allowed um, um, to collect after. If you didn't collect enough, then you stayed hungry. If you collect too much, what you collected that was too much turned into worms. It, it would pretty much degrade itself the next day. So he gave them just enough. But he made sure that they kept on going, they kept on going, they kept on going. And they were never hungry. For 40 years, they were never hungry. They were never hungry. God provided for them. And so this is the blessing for this church in Pagamam, that the Holy Spirit, our God, will hold them up and will provide for them. But they had to stay away from sexual immorality. They had to stay from idols. But for all that stayed steadfast in Jesus Christ, for all that did not give themselves up to sexual immorality and idols and food um, given to idols, they did not defile themselves in this way. He preserved them and he fed them himself. Praise the name of Jesus. Isn't that amazing how God loves us, that he will sustain you himself if he has to. He will sustain you himself. Then we go to the church in Teatira. So if this is you, Church of Pagamam, assess yourself and see, are you given to other idols? Are you given to other gods? Are you eating from the plate of idols? Are you eating from the plates of other gods? And if you are, repent. God will sustain you after you have conquered. The Lord will sustain you. He will not allow you to perish. He will keep you. He will keep you. There is hope. Um, then you go to the church in Teatira. The angel in the church in Teatira write, to the angel, and to the angel of the church in Teatira write, these are the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works your love, your faith, service, and endurance. I know that your latest works are greater than the first. So this church is growing. They are not like the church in Ephesus. They are not, um, their previous works were greater than the later works. This church is growing. Their works that are current versus the works that they started with, they are actually greater. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Wow, what a contrast, yeah? You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to engage in sexual immorality or prostitution and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed. 
and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing you into great distress unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. And I give to each of you as your works deserve. And to the rest of you in Theatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold on fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over nations to rule them with an iron scepter as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my father to the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the spirit is saying to the churches. So what is the Lord saying here? He's saying these people love him. They have faith. They have service. They have endurance. But they're failing in one thing. They're failing in taking down this false prophet. They're failing in taking down this prophet. Remember, the church in Ephesus was very good at detecting them and saying, no, we're not going to tolerate you anymore. Get out. But these ones, they are loving. They have faith. They are enduring. They are doing what... But then this false prophet is in their midst and they're having a hard time getting this person out. They're having a hard time. And he continues to say, beware, I'm throwing her on a bed and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress. So what does that tell you? You have a huge responsibility. And I think I said this before that we have a responsibility. It is our job to discern and to get ourselves outside of the places of um, worship that are of the prophets of Baal. It is our responsibility. And actually, um, just to give you a snippet of another video that I'm probably going to be recording today, where the Lord gave me a very heavy word. And he said, he told me to tell the church that you need to come out of the places of worship that are the altars of Baal. Meaning it is your responsibility to discern it. How do you discern? Pray. Seek the Lord your God and pray. Seek your Lord and the Lord your God, because this prophet of Jezebel, this prophet of Baal, is teaching and beguiling my servant to engage in sexual immorality or prostitution and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Sexual immorality, remember I have said, sexual immorality is not just having sex with human beings. Sexual immorality is also giving yourself to other gods, giving yourself to other priorities, giving yourself to other, other, other teachings that are teachings of demons, teachings um, that are telling you, oh, um, the Lord is, is breakthroughs, breakthroughs everywhere, breakthroughs, open, open gate. The Lord never judges you. The Lord never rebukes you. The Lord never teaches you. All he gives you is breakthroughs, breakthroughs, breakthroughs. And it's always money. All these prosperity teachers that are out there, prosperity ministries, they are demonic. Yes, I dare say that. Prosperity, the prosperity doctrine is demonic. It is not a doctrine of God. It is not a doctrine of God. Because it, it lifts up silver and gold, which is exactly what the Israelites did. They lifted up silver and gold. They gave it to Aaron and Aaron smelted it and built it into a calf. <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> excuse me he lifted up this calf they lifted up silver and gold to worship it Baal they lifted up silver and gold to worship it so are you going to continue like this and lift up silver and gold to worship it break down these altars take yourself out come out of Babylon Take yourself out of these places. Take yourself out. Otherwise, the distress I am throwing into great distress. Those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress unless they repent of her doings. So you're taking part, you're participating in the, you might go there and say, but I'm not the one sinning. He is the one sinning. I just go there for motivational speech. And great, you're going there for motivational speech. You want someone to motivate you and that's fine. That's fine. But remember, you're participating in their sin. Why? Your presence there motivates them. Think about it. If these churches, hmm? let's say someone like T.D. Jakes, I'm going to talk about T.D. Jakes because he's already been exposed in a lot of ways, right? Let's say someone, let's say today the Potter's house was empty. Would he have a people to beguile? Would he have a people to beguile, really? No, he would not. 
he has people to beguile because they are present it's like even the principle of prostitution the john and the prostitute and the prostitute would the prostitute be standing on the street turning tricks if the john was not there asking for the tricks anyway you know would the, would, would the prostitute be there the prostitute is there to supply demand the principle of supply and demand is very active even in the church the principle of supply and demand is very active if you're not present there will be no if, if you're not the demand is, is not there then there will be no supply the supply is there because the demand is present ponder that so this is the issue here but there are those that hold fast they stay in love with god they stay in faith and service and they endure and they have not given themselves up to the prophet jezebel and for these people again just like smyrna he tells them i do not require anything else of you stay steadfast stay strong keep moving keep doing what you're doing i ask nothing else of you nothing else of you just keep moving keep doing what you're supposed to do don't give yourself to jezebel stay away from jezebel just keep doing what you're supposed to do and after i am done you will reign with me i will give you authority over the nations to rule with them with an iron scepter as when clay pots are shattered even as i also receive authority from my father to the one who conquers i will also give the morning star let anyone who has an ear listen to the spirit and say to the churches what the spirit is saying to the churches so this is jesus christ giving you a message a clear message come out of jezebel come out of babylon come out of him come out of her come out do not allow yourself to participate in this idol worship do not allow yourself to be used improperly by these demonic prophets do not allow yourself to be used to be taught these improper doctrines but give yourself to the lord jesus christ wholly and completely and surely you will win surely you will win because he will always honor that which you have already done he sees your love he sees your faith he sees your service and your endurance stay steadfast stay steadfast may we all be found to be like those who stay steadfast and have not given themselves to the prophet jezebel okay let's go to chapter three and to the angel of the church in sadis write these are the words of him who has the seven spirits and the seven stars i know your works you have a name of being alive but you are dead Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Your works. For I have not found your works. Make a mental note of that. I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember, I know your works. You have a name of being alive. So you're doing a lot. But you're dead. You're dead. This is a church that is really founded on works. Um, as I was reading this, what was coming to my spirit is the issue of legalism. Like people who have a, oh yeah, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Do this, go here, go there, bend here. You know, they're very, very particular about um, the rules and regulations of being a Christian. You cannot call yourself a Christian if you don't come to church in a suit. You cannot call yourself a Christian if you if you um, wear a dress. Um, I'm just giving an example. Wear um, a dress above your knee, or um, I mean, not not that we should go to church in in, in like short shorts or anything. I'm not saying any of that because I think also you, you gotta have a balance. You gotta have a balance in your life. Uh, even in Ecclesiastes, it says that um, either extreme. Either extreme is unrighteous. It's unwise to have either extreme, right? So you can't come to church and say, oh, I'm coming as I am and you're wearing booty shorts. You, you, can't, you can't come to church like that and then tell me that you're a Christian. You've been doing that for a whole year and a half. I mean, come on now. 
at some point there has to be some growth there has to be some growth if you came at first with booty shorts at some point it needs to be bermuda shorts <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. It was funny in my head. Anyway, at some point it needs to be Bermuda shorts. Yes. And then the next time you come in palazzo pants. Then the next time you might decide to bring on a maxi dress. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying. Like you can't come in booty shorts for a whole three years and tell us that you're growing. I mean, come on. Let's be serious. Let's be serious. You don't go to work in booty shorts. Why don't you go? Because you have decorum for the place in which you're going. There's decorum for that place, right? So you, you need to have decorum when you come before God as a respect to God and also as a respect for other people around you because the word of God does say not to stumble one another, right? Anyway, I digress. Let me come back to topic. So these people have very strict rules and regulations, very strict rules. Now, for these people, they go on the other extreme. Dare you come to church in a scat that is touching your knees. You become a Jezebel. You are a whore. You're there to tempt all the men. And you're, you're, you're there to finish them with lust. That is your motive. Yet you, you, you simply just came to church. Like you, you had no motives. You weren't even thinking. It's not even tight. It's an A-line dress. That is maybe a midi. What we call a midi. For men who don't understand. Um, a midi is a dress that is slightly below your knee but um not quite at your shin like it's it's in the middle yeah it's an a-line dress but you know because because you're showing your 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 calves it's a problem or um because you came in jeans how dare you come to the house of the lord in jeans i've heard pastors say that online <laughs> how dare you come to the house of lord in uh, of the lord in jeans how dare you come to the house of the lord in in um a sleeveless shirt, how dare you? Or a short sleeve shirt, men, how dare you come to the house of the Lord in t-shirts? How dare you? How, how dare you wear a t-shirt? You know, and then you wonder, okay, so when, you, when I wear a t-shirt outside, and the same people, by the way, they will wear all these suits, they will wear all these nice dresses, but then you will meet them at the store on Wednesday in a booty short. And then you wonder, um, did the ability to tempt or stumble your brother stop on Sunday and somehow from Monday through Saturday or from Monday through Friday, depending on what church you go to, if you go to the Seventh-day Adventist church, that you, you dress any which way? Did somehow um, the ability to tempt somebody else stop on sunday you know it, it it has to make it make sense make it make sense you have all these legal stuff but you're, you're not and usually it's a lot of works a lot of rules a lot of laws but there's not a lot of faith there's not a lot of love there's not a lot of compassion there's not a lot of um there's not it's just people drumming the bible at you of the do's and don'ts but they don't do a lot of understanding of of how the word of God comes into play as far as taking us outside the covenant of the law. Breaking down the flesh. Because it is impossible to please God with our works. They are very good at works. But it is impossible. And because of their works, because of all these things they do, because even some of them will, will um, go and offer themselves to homeless shelters, will offer themselves, they do a lot of works. Some of them will even go and um, you'll find a church even sometimes they're, they're, they're doing the homeless shelters, they're doing um, food banks, they're doing, they're doing all these things, all these works. They have a lot of works that they're doing, but, there's, um, but it's impossible to please God with your works. And here the Lord says, um, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. So he's telling them point blank, your works are not working for me. Your works are not working for me. Why? Because you've put yourself under the law. And I think it's Paul who says in the book of Romans, yeah, Paul says in the book of Romans,
Romans 7 from verse 1 to 6. Um, I'm going to read all of this because I think it's important. And I mean, it's Bible study. I'm doing Bible study here and I'm just sharing what the Lord has shown me for me. And um, if you have something new that you think that you have learned from this, please feel free to write it in the comments. I welcome that myself. And um, yeah, because I'm, I'm also learning. Iron sharpens iron. Um, so in the book of Romans chapter 7, he says, Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. Thus, a married woman is bound to the law of her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning her husband. Accordingly, she is to be called, she will be called an adulteress, adulteress if she belongs to another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she belongs to another man, she is not an adulteress. So he's pretty much saying that when you're married to your spouse and your spouse is still living, and for whatever reason you are separated or you choose to divorce, which is very common in this day and time. Now, when you go and decide to remarry while your spouse is still alive, then what happens is you are considered an adulteress. Why? Because your covenant with this man is still alive and active because this person is still alive. But after he dies, then you are a free person. You can marry whomever you want because at that point you will not, you are a free agent, open to be connected with someone else and you'll be able to marry this other human being and not be considered an adulteress despite the fact that you had been married before for the simple reason that your spouse is no longer living. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, this is verse 4, this, you have died to the law through the body of Christ. So he's saying that when Jesus died on the cross, we died to the law. So that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, death to that which has held us captive, so that we are enslaved in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the written code. Now, is this to say that the laws are evil? Paul continues to say, when, what then are we to say? That the law is, is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. It was interesting because earlier today I was li lis listening to a someone by a man named uh, Derek Prince. I don't know if you know about him. He has very good a very good ministry. But he was talking about that. He was talking about that um, the law, the commandments, um, they are not there. We, we should not ignore them, per se, because what they do is they expose the sin that we have. And this is exactly what Paul is saying. He is saying that because of the law, that's how he came to know his sin. And he continues to say, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came in, sin revived and I died. So he is saying that in the days of ignorance, pretty much he's saying, in the days of ignorance, because I did not know, then it was not sin for me. But when the day I found out about this commandment that says do not covet, then the fact that I was coveting became sin. And then I died with this sin. And the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me because now I am, I am aware of my sin and I must fix myself. But instead of fixing myself, I find myself even wanting to sin more. Like I am producing more sin. I am... If it's um, do not kill, okay, fine, I won't kill. But then the Lord Jesus said, not only do I say do not kill, I say do not hate your brother because if you hate your brother, it is as if you have killed. So now I am aware that every time I hate, I kill. Then why is it that I cannot stop hating? I am hating everyone now. I'm hating my husband. I'm hating my mother-in-law. I'm hating even my own mother. I am hating my sister, my brother, my friend, my neighbor. I'm hating everybody. They say something mean to me, I hate them all of a sudden. Why is it that now I have this thing? And, and he continues to, uh, I think it is in verse. Um, so let's go back to where I was. You shall not covet. 
So I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the very commandment that promised life proved to me to be death. For sin seizing an opportunity in the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy, just and good. Did what is good then bring death? By no means. It was the sin that is working death in me through what is good in order that I may be shown what is sin to that so that to the commandment of sin might be sinful beyond measure. So he's saying this sin, it's the sin that is killing me. It is not the law that is killing me. It is the sin that is killing me. And now this commandment, sin has seized the opportunity because now I have learned about the commandment. Now it has grabbed a proper hold of me and I continue sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And this is why even later on he says that that which he wants to do, he finds that's what he find what that that which he wants to do, which is good. He is not doing and that which he does not want to do. He finds himself doing and he asks, now, oh man, who, who will help me? Who will save me? He asks that. Let me find it. Verse 24, he said, oh wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he points out that the only way I get saved is through Jesus Christ. So I can do all the works. I can say, oh, ouch. I can say I will not sin. I will not kill. I will not hit. I will not, I will not commit adultery. I won't love any other God. I won't have idols. I won't misuse God's name. I will keep the Sabbath holy. I will honor my parents. You can say all that. But remember, there is a principle in the commandment that if you break one, you have broken, you have broken all. If you do not kill, but then you commit adultery, you have broken all the commandments. And so it, it's, it's negligent. You might as well just go have a party with all the sins. You might as well. If you, if you, if you miss either one of the commandments, there's no such thing as a small sin and there's no such thing as I sin less than you. You are a sinner just as I am a sinner. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And if we say that we have not sinned, then we are calling God a liar. So that's pretty much what Paul is saying. But then he says that it is through Jesus Christ that you can be saved. So this church, this church in Sardis has that problem where they are, they, they are very focused, very focused on their works. And they're thinking that their works are helping them. But they are finding that they are dead. And the Lord Jesus is telling them, you, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're not alive, you're dead. And even the little bits of you that are alive are at the point of death. Your works are not proper for me. Why? Because it's impossible for you to please me. It is impossible for you to please me. And so what the Lord Jesus is telling them is to repent and to submit themselves to him. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. He's telling them to obey, to remember what they first learned, which is that we are not saved by works. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's very simple. It's not complicated. It's very simple. The Lord Jesus wants them to return back to him, to that first message, that very simple message. Not, not all these other legalistic stuff that they put on, all these traditions that they have put on, none of that. He just wants them to return to Jesus Christ. Simple. Just come to me. Come to me. I am your savior. I am your master. I am your master. Even Paul says that now, I am not a slave to sin anymore. I am a slave. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, I became, he, I was bought at a price. I was bought at a price. My sin was the spear that was above me. I was bought at a price. And now I have been given back to Jesus as his, he is my master. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what the requirement is for this church. Is that you're no longer legalistic. You're full of rules. You're full of all these things that you're saying. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. But he's saying, no, that is not working for you. You look like you're alive, but you're dead. And even the little bits of you that look alive, they're almost dying. Repent, come back to me. Let me clean you up. Let me wash you again. 
let me make you mine again so that you're no longer given to sin because as long as you're legalistic as long as you're trying to please me through the law we are not in unity we're not in one accord you're still given to your slave to your master who is sin but you need to turn around and come to me because i have a i already paid your price i already paid your price and it's not to say that your works will not continue they will continue but under me your master jesus christ is what he is saying not me sharon jesus christ yeah so that's what he's saying and he continues to say that for those because there's people who have not done this they have not soiled their clothes they will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy if you conquer you will be clothed like them in white robes and i will not erase your name from the book of life so these people are at risk of being erased from the book of life despite their works it is not then wrong that the lord jesus christ tells us that many will come and say oh we preached in your name we did this in your name we did that in your name but i will say that i will tell them no i do not know you so this is a very dangerous place to be in to be so legalistic that you fail to recognize that it's only through the lord jesus christ that you are saved it is not by works it is not by works it is by the lord jesus christ that you are saved your works are nothing. Yeah? Okay, let's move on to the church in Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow before your feet and I will learn, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word of endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one takes away your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar of the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Church of Philadelphia also is another church that you probably would, everybody should desire to be in. And, um, but there's something that I did notice. He did say something about them. He said that they are a church who have little power. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word. So these are people who have been faithful with little. They don't have, they don't have a lot of grandiose um like gr grand adventure in in their works in 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 their belief system or they just simply believe jesus christ is lord I, and they believe in the holy spirit they believe in god they believe in but they don't they have not been graced let me say it like that they have not been graced with a lot of power and the, but the lord has seen their faithfulness with a little and when i was reading this i was thinking of that lady who had who came with two two meters is it two meters two mites mites the two sh two pennies let me call them pennies because that's the the least currency that i know she came in with two pennies and she put it in the basket and then the lord jesus looked at it and said this woman who has put in two pennies has put in the most than everyone else who has been here because she has little yet she has given the most she has given much And that is what I, I see here is people who they don't have much and it, it's not necessarily even financial it could be just spiritual that they don't have much God, they have not been graced with much they've just been graced with very little but with that little they have been faithful they have been fervent they have endured they have held on to it with all their strength and they have refused to allow anything to take that away so these people the lord is saying that he will take them away. And I think um, when I was talking about um, the rapture, the last message that I did, 
think it's the last message I was talking about the rapture. And I, I did mention something like this. And I do believe that there's people that will be taken away and will not be allowed to be part of the tribulation, but it will not be a rapture. I believe it, it is people that will be saved with the harvest because there's a harvest that is going to happen. And I believe it's already happening even now because so many, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's so much death that is happening, random death. Um, like there's death in the news all the time. And those are the ones that are even meeting the news. And now there's other deaths that will not make the news. For example, someone is sick in hospital and they pass away. Someone is, um, um, suddenly they, you, you hear that people are being diagnosed with cancers and they are late stage cancers. You're, you're hearing about uh, people who have um, heart attacks out of nowhere um, or people who, you know, God is allowing people to pass on. He is allowing death in the world. He's allowing death even among the righteous. He is allowing death even among the righteous. And it is not because um, he hates them. He is allowing death among the righteous because he is, preser he is preserving them in his own way. Because remember, for God, I think there's a scripture that says that when the righteous perish, it is glorious. It is a glorious death to God. God does not weep over the righteous dying because they are coming back to him. He does not weep over the righteous dying. It is a glorious event when they come home to him. Right? So, and I know this is hard for people to see because for us who are living, it is very painful to realize that, you know, the loved one is no longer here. It is very painful to realize that we are not connected with them anymore. Yet, the Lord Jesus Christ delights when they come back home to him because he finally gets to enjoy their presence. They're no longer over there. He, they're with him. He gets to crown them. He gets to, to enjoy their fellowship. He gets to enjoy their worship. So for him, it is, not, it is not a sad event. It's a glorious event when they come home. It's a glorious event when they come home. Um, let me read uh, from the book. I believe it's in the book of Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah 57 verse 1, which says, The righteous perish, and no one considers why. The devout are taken away, while no one understands. That is due to the evil that the righteous are taken away. I think in the book of in, in NIV, in the NIV version, it says something that the God's is that God is sparing them, something to the effect of God is sparing them from the evil that is to come. And I believe that that is what is said here for the church of Philadelphia, that the Lord is sparing them. He is sparing them. He's saying, you know what? I know if I leave you here, you're not going to make it. So I'm going to spare you as a reward. I'm going to spare you. I'm going to keep you from, the, from that hour. I'm going to keep you away from that hour where the earth will have to endure a lot of tribulation. And praise God, if this is one of you, yes, you will go home and we will miss you. But it is okay. It is well with you. And for some reason, when I read this, I see a lot of elderly people, elderly people that have served God. Elderly people. Mm. Elderly people. Elderly people will die. A lot of elderly Christian people, the seniors. The Spirit of God is saying that he will take them home. I will take them home, he says. He says that I will take them home because I will not allow them to perish. They have served me. They have given themselves all their lives, is what he's saying. I will allow them to come home to me. I will save them from perdition, is what he's saying. I will save them from perdition. I will not allow them to perish. I will not allow them to perish. I will save them from perdition. These are my servants. Those whom I have called from the days of old, they have served me all their life. They have given themselves to me all their lives. And for this reason, as a reward to them, I will bring them home, says the Lord. I will bring them home, says the Lord. Praise the name of the living God. Our elderly people who have been serving Jesus Christ, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May you keep your heads together until your end of days. And as you rest, 
you will rest in complete peace in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go to the message of Laodicea. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And to the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Hallelujah. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by my fire so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe yourself and keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. Hmm. Doesn't he always say, every time I have a message, I've noticed the Lord Jesus has been saying, return to me and I will return to you. And that, that is written here. Pretty much what he's saying, come, I will eat with you and you will eat with me. To the one who conquers, I have given a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquer and sat, conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So who are these people? These are people who are comfortable. They don't feel a need for anything. They don't feel a go need for God. We trust in material things. The things of this world. Big boy bazoo. Is what we call them in Kenya. Hmm? Some of them, they are members of church. I mean, big boy bazoo, usually it's not, they're not in church. But I'm talking about people in the church. You're wealthy, God has blessed you. It is no wonder that the Lord Jesus Christ said that it is very hard to get a Christian to go into heaven. It's, it's easier to put a thread to the eye of, a camel to the eye of a needle <clears throat> than it is to get a rich man to get into heaven. Why? Because there is a lack of, uh, there, there's no need to pursue God. They lack a need to pursue God. We lack a need to pursue God. Mm. And to a degree, I believe my husband and I had started being like this. And maybe that is why the Lord Jesus Christ made sure that, um, fun fact, let me tell you a part of my testimony. I, the week before the calamity struck my home, I was about to go on contract. And essentially, I would have been, uh, I'm a registered nurse by, in training, by profession. Right now, I have kind of abdicated that job. But like, I was, as a nurse, you have a lot of opportunity to make money. But I've gotten, I had gotten an opportunity in contract where I was, uh, I, had, I had signed it and everything. It was just a matter of me flying in. I had the opportunity to literally triple my income just like that. Just like that. I'd gotten an assignment. I was going to go up north and it was in the winter. So I knew that if I went there and I was going to go alone, my husband and I had talked about it. I was going to go alone. My income would have tripled. And my husband already was, had a very high income job himself. So with my income tripling and him having a high income job, what that would have done is we would have been in a space where I honestly believe, and I told this to my sister-in-law when she called me, when I told, when she found out what had happened in my home and she was concerned about me. I told her this, I told her, her name is Pasi. I told her, Pasi, you know what? I really think God saved me because I think if I would have gone for that contract, I would have been untouchable in my own head. My pride would have been so high, so high that I don't think I would have been, it would have been easy to bring me down to a human level. My pride, my pride, I was very proud. I have to admit this. I was a very proud woman. I'd become a very proud woman. I had no problem. Even when I traveled to Kenya, I'm sure there's people that would see me and they would say, oh my goodness, this woman is back. I was very mean very mean i had to make 
the spirit of God was very stern with me when I started repenting. He was very stern with me. He made me call people and apologize because of how I had behaved. I had behaved very poorly. I was about to get to this level where because I had more than enough, I already had more than enough, but because at that point I would have had more than more than enough, I would have been so proud, so haughty. Oh, I don't think I would have been able to come back to Jesus Christ. I would have felt like I am a God. I would have been like that stiff, fertile person. Who says, I am God Almighty, like a fool, that idiot. Yes, that's foolishness. To call yourself God is foolishness. It is foolishness. It's complete foolishness to call yourself God. You are not a God. Nobody is God. There's only one God, the creator of heaven and earth. The one who can take us and crush us just at this um, a boy, he doesn't have to touch you. He has to say, send a word. And it becomes just the, the same way he sent a word and he created all things. We are not gods. We are created in the image of God, but we are not gods. We are but human beings, even angels. Do you know even the devil? By the way, the devil in station, in station, he is an angel. In station, he is of the class of angels. So if I was to stand barely as a human being and the devil was before me, Lucifer was before me, as a simple human being, he has power over me. David himself said, what manner of love is this that you consider man to be just as lower as, in, we're just below the angels is what we are. We are below the angels. We are not gods. We are not gods. Don't let anybody lie to you. These new age preachers, please turn away from that demonic doctrine. That is a demonic doctrine. It brings in pride. And then when things don't go your way, you start being attacked left, right and center by demons. What demons, you'll ask? Oppression, depression, anxiety. Why? Because you expected to manifest and you did not. You expected to manifest, whatever that means. You expected to, to, to show yourself strong, and now you're weak. You learn you're weak, and it brings you very low. Your self-esteem comes down very low, and the devil loves it when that happens. He loves it. He sends his demons to come and press you down further. That's how he does you. And then you wonder why there's such depression when things like when 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 my, when I couldn't go for my contract, when I couldn't go when 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 things were wrong in my household, and then I realized that I wasn't as high, I wasn't as esteemed as I thought I was, I wasn't as big as I had made myself out to be in my own head. Depression set in. I was depressed. I was suicidal. Friends, I was I had a plan. It wasn't just suicide without a plan. It was suicide with a plan. And the only thing that kept me alive was my little boy. Because I would look at him and say, my boy needs a mom. He can't survive this earth without a mom. He needs me. That is the only reason why I did, I, that kept me from doing it. I have a place set outside for my son. I thought of hanging myself there. That was my plan. I was going to tie a sheet. I even started looking at like types of nooses to make. And I, I was going to hang myself. I was going to hang myself. It was going to be death by hanging. But I thank the Lord Jesus Christ because he kept me, like he kept bringing my son in front of me. My, my neighbor doesn't know this, but one day I took my son to her because I feared that I was, it was so, the, the, the need to kill myself was so heavy on me. I, I, I called her and I told her, come get my son. He's, I don't feel like I want my son to be here right now because of how I am right now. And she came. She was very gracious. She came. She took my son. 
But what she didn't know is that that day I was battling the spirit of depression and suicidal ideation that day. And the minute my son left, when she took my son, all I did was just lay down in my cocoon and I slept. She didn't know that. So this, this need to feel like we are gods, we are not gods. The enemy uses that as a tool to oppress us. Because once things don't work your way, he has no problem. The devil doesn't have a problem. Remember, he hates us. He hates us because unlike him, we have an opportunity to be with God, to go make it in heaven. His station was taken away from him. His place in heaven was taken away from him and he was scattered and he has been promised that he will be judged and end up in the lake of fire. He is very aware of this. Very, very aware of this. He is very aware of this. So he doesn't have a problem lifting you so high up, so high up, you're lifted so high up and then suddenly he crushes you down. Bah! While you're down on the ground, then he reaches for you to press you down further. He doesn't have a problem doing that. He wants that. He wants you to die because he knows once you kill yourself by suicide, there's no opportunity for you to go in heaven. Death by suicide I don't, will not send you to heaven. It will not. It's a spirit of heaviness that just bears you down so deep. Hmm. So, back to the church in Laodicea. I think I digressed again. So these people, they don't feel a need for God. Just like I, I probably would not have felt a need for God. They don't feel a need for God. They're lukewarm. They're in church. Oh, I want to... Um, it's okay for me to have sex with my partner as long as we have the intention of, have, of being married. It's okay for me to um, go party once in a while. I mean, God wants us to have fun too. It's okay for me to go to my concerts. I mean, I love Beyonce. It's not like I have a Ouija board in my house. I just love her music. That's all. It's nothing much. Just music. I'm just going to listen to music. That's all. Forget that um, all her music is very sexually charged. We don't care about that. It's okay for me. Um, you know, I don't do anything else. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't use drugs. I don't um, drink. I don't use um, cigarettes. I don't. Um, I don't club. I don't um, do anything else. Um, but you know, sometimes you know, I am sexually. I have sexual needs too, so sometimes I watch pornography here and there, and that's okay. Hmm? I mean, I don't do any sin. I don't. I don't do anything. Um, I, I. I don't break any of the Ten Commandments, but you know. A lie here and there, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's really bad. I don't think it's really bad for me to lie here and there. I mean, I know it's borderline. You, have, you, have, you even have borderlines of sin. I know it's borderline, but it's not really sin. The Lord is saying that he's going to spit you out. You need to make a choice. Are you hot or cold? Make a choice. Make a choice. There's no time for waiting. Repent. Time is short. No time. Anyway, I'm going to end there. I trust that we all understand that if there's one sequence that you have met in all this is that there's a reward for every church for doing right. There's a reward. And the standard reward for every person is that the second death will not have power over you. The second death will not have power over you. And where does that begin? First, it begins with repentance. 
what is repentance repentance is acknowledging first of all that you have done wrong you have done wrong acknowledging it and um i'm gonna say this there's this prayer that christians like to make father god if i have sinned if i have sinned i told my husband this uh one time <laughs> and he got upset with me when we were at first um trying to get back with god and i told him you know what i think it's very disrespectful for anybody to tell god father if i have sinned forgive me if i if i have any sin on me please forgive me if i have any sin on me if i have any sin on me what is that when we interact with fellow human beings and you're walking on the street and you bump them your immediate there is no question of what you've done you say i'm sorry oh sorry 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 but then you go and you, you you sleep with your fiance or you go and um you you use trickery you're corrupt you bribe your way through things and you take bribes hmm? you um you you go to tarot readings you go on horoscopes and then you come and say if i have any sin on me come on Repentance comes from, first of all, acknowledging your sin and taking full responsibility for your sin. Take full, full responsibility. Make no excuses. Even David himself said that in the days that I kept quiet, my bones wilted within me. His bones wilted within him. Your very construct is destroyed. When you fail to acknowledge your sin, you have to acknowledge your sin. You need to acknowledge your sin. All of it. Take responsibility for all of it. It is your responsibility to take responsibility for all of it. Hmm? So that is where repentance, that's how we, that's your first responsibility is to repent, to say, yes, I have done this against you and only you have I sinned. Forgive me, Lord, create in me a clean heart and create a steadfast spirit within me. And then, and then after that, don't go back and do it. Turn away. It's a turning away. Repentance by definition is a turning away. Turn your back on your sin. So if you're a drunkard, stay away from drunk drinking, stay away from the drunks. Throw away the beer that is. Don't drink it because you bought it. Stay away from the drinks in your house. Dump them. Trust me, a hundred bucks on a bottle of liquor is not worth your salvation. You're more expensive than that. God himself died for you. You're that expensive. So honor that. Honor that. Respect yourself and respect the God that was slain for your for your sake respect yourself and respect god you're very important very very important to him that's why he took that extra measure he didn't have to he could have just watered the whole earth and killed us all he's done it before or he could have just thrown fire on all of us he wasn't bound by any covenant he could have just burned us all burn them all he didn't do that. He loves us. He wants communion with us. He wants fellowship with us. And even at the end of all this, he is looking to have a new heaven and a new earth where he dwells among us because that was his original plan. Hmm? So I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will show you the way that you will see yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself and see yourself for what exactly you are. And if the Holy Spirit convicts you and tells you this is who you are, I, 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 I ask you to pray and ask God who you are. Like I said, I prayed and I can identify where I fell and I can identify where I was headed. I was terrible. But I thank God for mercy. I thank God for grace. Surely he loved me. He loved me. For God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever Whomever, it doesn't matter what you've done. Whomever believes in him will not perish. Whoever believes, repents, and turns away from their evil ways will not perish but have everlasting life. Humble yourself, pride of man. 
my pride was my from the beginning my pride was my problem from my falling away my pride was my problem nothing else my pride i can i cannot blame it on any pastor i cannot blame it on anybody it is all me it is all me my pride my pride was my problem and for all of you if you if you examine yourself properly your pride if you're sinning your pride is your problem because somehow in your head you've convinced yourself you can get away with it may god help us i'm gonna close now it's been an hour and a half let's pray everlasting father we give you praise we give you honor god i thank you for your word i thank you because it is life i thank you because it is a double-edged sword i thank you because it cuts us and cuts us deep it does not leave us thinking about other things or, 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 or being confused oh god as long as we seek it with a pure heart and an open mind ready to be rebuked ready to be loved will be ready to be embraced ready to be cleaned up ready even to be comforted father i thank you i thank you i thank you i thank you lord you are worthy of all praise you're worthy of all honor i pray for every person that takes the time to listen yes this is a long video but may you give them grace to listen to the end and I pray that, Lord Jesus, you will teach them about yourself, Lord. Even what I have not been able to decipher, Lord, may you help them to decipher because you're the spirit of all truth. You know all things. You know our hearts, our minds. And even as you said that, you know every heart and every mind and you will reward us based on what we have done. So I pray, Lord, that you show ourselves to us, O oh Lord. Show me to myself. Show them to themselves, O oh God. That, Father, even the sins that are hidden, we might repent of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I bless you and I thank God for you. May God keep you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.